everyone, welcome. We're just letting everyone in. So it'll just be a few minutes as everyone comes in. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, welcome. Just letting everyone in here. It'll just be a couple more minutes before we get started. Thanks so much. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I have your cameras and your microphones set to off. It's not that I don't wanna see you. I really do, um, but we wanna make sure that everyone's focused on the program this evening. We have Alexis coming all the way from Marseille who's gonna be showing us videos and uh, we just don't want anything to distract from that. So welcome everyone. My name is Sari. I am the Public Programs Director of MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. And welcome to A Taste of Marseille. Um, I know some of you have been to our programs before with Culinary Backstreets. This is our third partnership program with Culinary Backstreets. You have heard me before say they are my favorite food tour company in the whole world. I will say it again because it remains true. I am so looking forward to the day when I can take one of their in-tour, in-person tours again. Um, but until then, I am so thrilled that we get to do these fantastic virtual programs with them. Um, so I know some of you ordered the box with your ticket. So you might have the products in front of you. You got my email that says maybe have a little pastis or a little wine. I hope you are all having a little uh, apero happy hour to enjoy this evening. Um, I'm very happy to introduce you to Alexa Steinman. She is in Marseille, France right now. Uh, it's 11 o'clock there, luckily not 12 o'clock due to the uh, daylight savings time. So I'm gonna pass it over to her. She's gonna show you some videos and talk about her tour in Marseille that she would normally give in person. And then at the end, there's gonna be time for a Q&A. So I'm gonna come back at the very end and take your questions and uh, help Alexis answer those for you. So over to you, Alexis, everyone enjoy. Hello everyone, bonjour. Um, thank you, sorry for that lovely intro. And thank you MOFAD for organizing this event and for us being able to travel and taste together from afar. Welcome to all of you across the Atlantic and across the globe, from Montreal to Mamaroneck, from Seattle to Birmingham. I'm so happy that we could be here together and I hope one day you get to come to Marseille so I can show you around the city myself. First, I wanted to start with a little bit about Culinary Backstreets. We are known as the Global Guide to Local Eats. We are based in 15 cities across the globe and we've chosen each of them for their rich culinary culture. We're really passionate about celebrating and preserving the food tradition of each place. We do this by hosting intimate food tours and multi-day trips in which we visit authentic, local, and off the beaten path places. We also have a publishing component. We publish books to some of our cities, and then we have a website, culinarybackstreets.com, where we publish write-ups on restaurants, winemakers, bread bakers, cheese makers, you name it. And these all really give a portrait of the city that we cover, as well as giving you a really good how-to guide for when you get to come visit. We're really passionate about how food is the gateway into what makes cities tick. It allows you to really experience a place like a local and also interact in an intimate way with people. In this age of globalization, where cities are becoming more homogenized than ever, we really feel it's important too for our work to preserve the mom and pop, the local and the small places so that cities really keep their identity. We, we launched in Marseille in 2019. Marseille is France's second largest city, but it remains pretty unknown and rather misunderstood. There's been this negative narrative about the French connection, the drugs, mafia, poverty, and all of that focus has really, even though the Marseillais were, were really a proud people, it's really made the city where they don't realize how incredible it is. They don't realize that the city is 2,600 years old. It's almost as old as Rome. And because of that, as this open port and on the Mediterranean, it has had cultures, ingredients, people, and traditions all enter through its port. And that's just created this incredible diversity and this really rich multicultural heft. 
the people that have been able to really see that about Marseille have been the outsiders. There have been many writers who have come through and they're the one who has kind of done the best marketing of Marseille. Julia Child came here and she was living in Paris with her husband and she called it a rich broth of vigorous, emotional, uninhibited life. The novelist Blaise Senders, who was a Swiss novelist, he likened it to Rome, but he said, Rome has monuments. Marseille isn't a city of sites. The city is a site itself. And that's also sort of what I'm doing here is telling the stories of Marseille. My, uh, my living in Marseille kind of happened by chance. I was following the dream of picking grapes in the south of France. And a friend texted me a picture of the hardware store in Marseille that happens to be France's oldest hardware store and quite possibly the coolest store I've ever been to. I am a lifelong Francophile. I studied and lived in Paris and I'd never heard of Marseille. And I came to the city and I was instantly hooked. It's, it's surrounded by these craggy limestone cliffs. It's 111 villages that are each its own kind of beat and personality that are all tied into one. It's singular, it's different, it's laid back, it's Southern, it's cool. It, it, it's really, it's more Mediterranean than French. Uh, the late and great Anthony Bourdain, he once famously quipped that it's his fav favorite French city because it's like France, but without the French. <laughs> Um, one of the best ways to, to get to know Marseille is really through its food. By tasting a mafe from the Ivory Coast or sujuk from Armenia, you really can see these different migrant stories that came through. When you're on the beach and you're eating fresh seafood and, and urchins and oysters just caught below you in the Mediterranean, you understand the centuries of rich fishing tradition here. And because Marseille is the capital of Provence, there's always a lot of olive oil, garlic, tomatoes, thyme, you name it. They say there's a local food historian here who says that if the French cuisine is a tree, its leaves are in Paris, but its roots reside in Marseille. On this virtual tour today, we are going to visit a distillery that started in Algeria when it was occupied by France. We're gonna taste spices that are 150 years old and we're gonna to go to a chocolatier. It's run by a Turkish Armenian couple who make a chocolate bar that you can only find in Marseille. By doing so, by visiting the shops, the neighborhoods, the people who make these products, hopefully you'll get a taste of Marseille that can tide you over until you're able to take a plane and come visit. To get started, I wanted to show you a little Bienvenue à Marseille video to introduce you to my city. Sorry about that. I think we're having a technical difficulty, but we're going to have Paula jump in and show the video.
Sorry, I'm going to try again to run the video. Uh, technical difficulties, I apologize. All right, Great. I hope you enjoyed Enjoy that, that team tour. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. I was telling the team before, right now we are in the midst of the Mistral, which is the famous wind of Marseille that can blow like over a hundred miles per hour. And I was a little worried about things like Wi-Fi knocking out. It's also it does make people a little crazy. It's what Van Gogh attributed to cutting off his ear, so. We're going to hope that uh, everything <laughs> stays normal and I don't go crazy. And I think now is the perfect time to talk about Apro and have a drink. <laughs> so we're going to start our tour. Apro is short for Aperitif, and it is revered like a religion in Marseille. It, it really embodies the city's joie de vivre and sociability. It's um, why we get together every night after work. The tourist office listed at one of the top five things you must do in the city. And unlike happy hour in other countries where it sort of is sandwiched between work and dinner, our aperos, they tend to go stretch long into the night. The most popular drink in Marseille is a pastis. It was created here in 1932. It's similar to the family of anise-based beverages like Rocky in Turkey and Uzo in Greece. Uh, some people confuse pastis with absinthe. They are both made from a type of anise, but pastis is made from star anise, which comes from China, and absinthe is made from green anise, which is more from around here. The pastis it got created, actually, though, because of a ban on absinthe during World War I, and Paul Ricard, who was a wine merchant at the time, all the bartenders were making their kind of own illegal brands of anise beverages so that the Marseille could quench their thirst. And he was savvy enough to market and brand it and then even come up with a name, which was Pastis. It also comes from anisette, which are the anise-based beverages that were created in Algeria when the French colonized it in the 19th century. I couldn't actually send you alcohol in the boxes, so instead I sent these lovely aperitif glasses. This one is from Crystal Limignana, which is one of the city's last distilleries. They started in Algeria making anisette, and when they moved to Marseille in 1962, they realized they had to make pastis to fit in. They also, a uh, little known fact, they make kosher pastis because the city has a very large Jewish community, and so a rabbi comes and blesses the pastis once a year. We're going to take a visit to Crystal Limignana and meet the great granddaughter of the founder, Mary Stella. She's going to talk about the history of the distillery, talk about the difference between pastis and anisette, and she's also, most importantly, going to tell you how to dose your pastis. Hint, there's a lot more water than you think. Let's take a visit.
s'appelle Maristella, Maristella Pasco. Moi, je dirige la société Cristal Liminiana à Marseille. Donc, on est une distillerie, une fabrique de spiritueux spécialisée dans les anisés. Notre spécialisé, c'est l'anisette et le pastis. Et qu'est-ce que ça veut dire un anisé Un anisé, donc c'est un apéritif fait à base d'anis, euh, qui est vraiment la boisson emblématique de Marseille. Donc le pastis, comme le fossea, et puis l'anisette, comme le cristal anis. Et c'est quoi les différences entre le pastis et l'anis Alors, tous les deux font 45 degrés et se servent avec de l'eau. Il faut le mélanger à de l'eau. Mais la différence entre les deux, c'est que l'anisette, ça n'est que de l'anis, alors que dans le pastis, il y a au moins du réglisse et de l'anis. Et, euh, et Cristal Emiliana, ça a commencé quand Cristal Emiliana, ça a commencé en 1884, donc il y a plus de 130 ans. C'était mon arrière-grand-père qui avait créé cette société. Okay. Euh, en Algérie d'abord, hein, donc il était parti d'Espagne. Il avait traversé la mer Méditerranée pour rejoindre un cousin en Algérie. Et là-bas, ils ont travaillé dans un bar et beaucoup d'Espagnols réclamaient l'anisette, la paloma, comme on l'appelle en Espagne. Donc en fait, le cristal anis, c'est une recette espagnole à la base, okay. qui a été donc euh, transportée d'Espagne en Algérie et d'Algérie à Marseille. Oui, génial. Et euh, est-ce que vous pouvez parler de logo de verre, en fait le logo, en fait, c'est la, la représentation du pacha. Le pacha, c'est le prince euh, dans le monde arabe. Donc, en fait, c'est un, un serveur qui est habillé en pacha avec un turban. Okay. Et la bouteille, le plateau et la bouteille d'anisette. Okay. La bouteille hexagonale, hein, puisque la bouteille est hexagonale. C'est vraiment notre marque de fabrique puisqu'elle est euh, fabriquée que pour nous. Hein. Ah ouais, super. Et euh, est-ce qu'on peut goûter euh... Bien sûr. <rire> super. Bien sûr. Alors, on va commencer par l'anisette. Ok. Donc, euh, comme je vous disais, l'anisette, ça n'est que de l'anis. Ok. C'est pour ça que c'est transparent dans la bouteille, puisque c'est les deux l'anis distillée. Donc, une plante distillée forcément transparente. Et ensuite, elle se colore pour différentes raisons. Euh, et notamment, il se produit un petit phénomène. <rire> Et c'est quoi le ratio tout... entre l'eau et la anis Alors, ça c'est vraiment au goût de chacun. Il n'y a pas de loi, il n'y a pas de règle. <rire> Donc, euh, si on a soif, si on a très soif, on met un petit peu d'anisette et beaucoup d'eau. Et si euh, vraiment on veut euh, le consommer comme un digestif, par exemple, euh, en fin de repas pour la digestion, euh, on met juste un petit peu d'eau. Okay. C'est vraiment au goût de chacun. On okay. peut rajouter des glaçons aussi. Mais si l'eau est fraîche, il n'y a pas besoin. Ok, voilà. Voilà. Parfait. Donc ça, c'est l'anisette. Ouais. Euh, donc, il se colore en blanc, qui se transforme en blanc quand on ajoute de l'eau. Ok. Voilà. Et le pastis, c'est le même couleur ou c'est... Non. Donc, le pastis, dans la bouteille, il est plutôt marron. Ça, ça vient du fait qu'il y ait du réglisse macéré. Donc, le, le réglisse, c'est un... Un bois, on va dire. Oh. Et euh, donc, quand on le fait macérer dans de l'alcool, l'alcool prend la couleur et le goût, évidemment, du réglisse qui devient marron. Et donc, quand on rajoute de l'eau, là, pour le coup, ça devient euh, jeune marron. Oui, oui, tout à fait. <rire> D'ailleurs, à Marseille, l'autre nom du pastis, c'est le petit jaune. Le ah petit oui, jaune. Le petit jaune, exactement. Voilà. Et qu'est-ce qu'on dit quand on trinque euh, en français En français, on dit chin chin. Chin chin. Santé. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Hein. <rire>
if you have the chance to come to Marseille, there are a few kind of artisanal producers now that are really making really tasty stuff. So with Apero, because this is France after all, it's never just about drinking, it's always about eating too. And that's also what allows them to go on longer into the night so you don't get too intoxicated. We like to have something salty, something crunchy. So it could be grissini, crostini. It can be dips like tapenade and ashwayad, charcuterie, almonds, uh, sometimes hummus. There's always olives because uh, the city is surrounded by olive groves in Provence and it pairs really, really well with pastis de rosé. You'll either see them whole or they'll be in a tapenade. And about a year ago, I was at the farmer's market and I met a woman who makes these olive crackers. And they're, I don't know why anyone started, didn't do this before. She basically puts tapenade into a cracker. And so you get the crunch and the saltiness all in one really tasty snack. So um, I also think she represents the city has really kind of a, a new creative artisanal movement of people really trying to make kind of homemade products that really embody the city and have a little bit of creativity to uh, watch out once you open them. They're pretty hard to not eat the whole bag. <laughs> so uh, let's take a trip. We're going to go to Melanie. Uh, she makes these crackers in her home kitchen in the neighborhood of Belle Sons. Let's take a look and see how they're made. Sorry, one moment. The Port Dex Arch and the tree lined Cor Bessans Boulevard illustrate Belsans bourgeois history. Now the neighborhood is working class with Maghrebi and African shops and residents. This is where I find Melanie Ibrahim, a Marseillaise of Syrian Lebanese descent, who makes small batch snacks under her Lubada brand. Marseillaise of Syrian Lebanese descent, who makes small batch snacks under her Lubada brand. Oui. 
Je fais que ce que j'arrive à faire à la main et puis je recommence. Oui. <rire> <laughs> the bottle began with sugary biscuit. When Melanie noticed a lack of savory treats on the market, she made her salty crackers inspired by the olives served by local bars at Apero. <laughs> Quand toi tu as décrit ces recettes, ça a pris combien de temps pour vraiment euh, perfecter euh... Disons que je ne fais pas les choses toutes d'un coup. <rire> Il y a ouais. plusieurs, euh... Et c'était quelqu'un qui t'avait demandé euh, de faire quelque chose salé ou c'était Non, alors ça, ça c'est une idée que j'avais, euh, qui me trottait dans la tête, de faire une recette salée, de faire des biscuits salés pour l'été. Ok. Parce que je fais un peu une recette par saison. Et euh, voilà, donc euh, j'en ai fait euh, trois. Finalement, j'en ai encore deux. Le troisième, euh, ça, il ne me plaisait pas trop, je ne l'ai pas gardé. Et, et, et en fait, comme ça a bien marché et que ça manquait, comme tu dis, que les gens ils étaient contents d'avoir des biscuits d'apéro et ouais. pas que en été. Oui. Du coup, j'ai décidé de continuer. Euh, de il me tue l'année. Voilà. <rire> c'est ça, c'est ça pour mon entourage. Euh... Nevada is Marseille slang for the extra bit. That's the inspiration behind Melanie's company to give your taste buds an extra special something. that I could send all of you those olive crackers right now, but because she's so local and she only sends at farmer's market, you're gonna have to come to Marseille to get them here. <laughs> so next up, another Apro snack. We, we can't talk about Marseille without talking about the sea. We are on 26 miles of coastline and there's been centuries of fishing industry in the city. On pretty much every menu, you'll find seafood and fish throughout the year particularly sardines, anchovies, tuna, dorade, which is sea bream, and then depending on the season, oysters and sea urchins. Once the city had a booming port and it was a lot of uh, fishing throughout the Mediterranean, the problem is, is that the Mediterranean has sadly been overfished. So the city now is mostly smaller independent fishermen and you can go to the fish market every day at the Via Port and actually pick up a fresh catch, which is where chefs and locals will shop. We also love our tinned fish, particularly sardines and anchovies. Anchovies are actually our most popular pizza topping. A little known fact is that Marseille, it rivals New York in the number of pizza parlors, thanks to the Italian immigrants who brought pizza over here in the 19th century. We love also anchoyade, which, can, which is like um, tapenade's briny cousin, basically tapenade made with anchovies instead. You can either make it fresh at home where you just throw fillets of anchovies, olive oil, garlic, and capers in a blender, or a lot of people like to buy them in a jar because it's easier, it's really good for picnics, and the quality is great. This anchoyade is from La Bonne Mer, and it is made in Port Saint-Louis de Rome, which is a city about an hour outside of Marseille. This is the last standing cannery on the French Mediterranean. So we like to support them. Now we're gonna take a trip to Port Saint-Louis de Rome, but first we're gonna stop by the Marseille fish market so you can have a look. Fish market sets up every morning at the Vieux Port, the old harbor that is the heart of Marseille. On weekends, there are a dozen stalls. On winter weekdays, only a few brave the cold. The fishermen unload their early morning catch onto blue wooden tables. 
Both locals and chefs come for the fresh fish to be grilled whole or used for bouillabaisse in nearby restaurants. You'll find a whole sea bream, mackerel, calamari, red mullet, and of course, Marseille's beloved sardines. Forty miles east of Marseille, Port saint louis de rome sits at the mouth of the Rhone River and the Mediterranean. This town at the end of the world is a gateway to the Camargue, a marshland and regional natural park famous for bird migration, salt cultivation, and wild white horses. Thanks to its seaside perch, Port saint louis de rome has long been linked to fishing and maritime industries. And it's home to Ferrigno, the family-run cannery that makes the Bon Mer Anjoyade. Its owner, Dominique, was happy to share his story with us, though too shy to be on camera. Et c'était une mer, la, la, la mer méditerranéenne en Algérie n'était pas exploitée. De vers 1930-35, il a commencé à créer une usine en Algérie, une conserve de poissons. Euh, ensuite, après, les enfants en grandissant, ils ont commencé à travailler aussi des, des gens de l'hôpital familial en 1940, etc. Donc, Ensuite, en 1962, il y a eu l'indépendance de l'Algérie. De ce fait, donc, ils sont partis en 1962 euh, d'Algérie pour partir donc, ici, donc, en France, en métropole, à port saint louis -de Pourquoi port saint louis -de Parce que nous avons l'Europe, c'est-à-dire l'eau de fleuve, le fleuve, l'eau douce et l'eau salée, développe un plancton. Et la sardine se, se nourrit de plantons. Et c'est en 1985 que, que je suis rentré dans l'entreprise. Ensuite, en, aux alentours de 1998, je me suis dit, là maintenant, la sardine en a fait un tour. Donc, et, et là maintenant, je vais faire autre chose. Je vais faire des plats cuisinés. Et parce que j'aime bien la cuisine, je, je voulais faire cuisiner moi à mon départ, je voulais faire cuisiner. Donc, et là, je me suis donc investi dans la cuisine. Et c'est là qu'on a développé donc, tout ce qui est nos recettes actuelles, la soupe de poisson. Et quand est-ce que vous avez développé le, la gamme La Bonne Mère Alors, La Bonne Mère, c'est aux alentours de 2000, 2005 à peu près, 2006, euh, avec donc, des produits bio, donc avec des sections de produits bio, euh, l'enchoyade. Donc, c'est un mélange, euh, un mélange d'enchois d'huile, de carte, etc. Et on met un petit peu de, de, de lait à l'intérieur. Pourquoi Parce que ça permet d'adoucir un petit peu l'anchois. Et pas tout le monde aime ce, ce fort de l'anchois. Donc on, on, on a amélioré l'anchois, la peine qu'elle soit plus, un peu plus douce. Voilà. Oui, c'est intéressant. Moi, j'avais fait plusieurs dégustations oui. et j'avais choisi en tête une vôtre à, grâce à ça, parce que j'avais dit, on n'a pas le choix, c'est vrai que c'est assez fort. La de et ça donne en fait qui est bien, ça donne les gens une façon de tester ça, même s'ils ne savent pas qu'ils aiment les anchois. Voilà. Ici, est-ce que c'est un des dernières conserveries dans le Méditerranéen et... Alors, en Méditerranée française, donc c'est la dernière conserverie que nous avons en Méditerranée. Ben, euh, C'est-à-dire qu'auparavant, euh, c'était quand même de son de d'Algérie, il y avait en France 170 conserveries de poissons. Wow. Et là maintenant, nous sommes euh, 6, 7. Euh, Et comment vous, vous aimez manger le, votre anchoyade Alors, euh, l'anchoyade, c'est souvent pas de plusieurs façons. Bien, vous avez la façon du couteau, c'est-à-dire en Amérique. Ensuite, après, en entrée, en entrée, vous faites des légumes, par exemple, des légumes de fruits, des carottes, euh, artichauts, etc. Et vous mettez une petite cuillère, donc dans votre assiette, vous mettez des cuillères de l'enfoyade, et vous prenez votre enfoyade, et vous mangez vos légumes à l'échange. Ça, c'est comment j'ai bien mangé. Parfait. Et il euh... y a des légumes de fruits, c'est pas mal. Ouais, ouais, je sais pas. Bon appétit!
I hope you like that little virtual road trip to Port saint -Lidon. A little backstory about Le Bon Mer. The name uh, for any of you who remember your high school French, Bon Mer means good sea. It also means the good mother. And in Marseille, our most famous monument is nicknamed the Good Mother. It's a church called Notre Dame de la Garde, and she's topped with a golden virgin mother and child. This church is the highest building in the city. It is illegal to build any other buildings that's as tall as her. And she is perched up on a hill and the locals will go there and pray for their protection. So back in the day when it was a big fishing city, they would come and they would bring wooden boats. They would bring weirdly paintings of boat crashes <laughs> and boats capsizing, capsizing. And so the church, it has this really opulent golden mosaic interior. And then also all these little wooden boats and life preservers. And it really gives it this wonderful nautical feel that really embodies the nautical nature of, of Marseille. So uh, another icon of the city is a spice blend that's called Les Épices Rabelais. This, this really uh, marries Marseille, uh, Marseille standing as the Porte d'Orient, which is the gateway of the Orient, and the fact that we are in Provence. The Epice Rabelais is a secret recipe. It apparently has over 100 ingredients that no one can talk about, but it's essentially like quatre épices, which is France's version of allspice, and then mixed with aromatics from the surrounding hills of Marseille, so rosemary, sage, thyme, and the like. The Epice Rabelais was created by someone named Raymond de Maison, and he was an equally clever marketing man, just like Paul Ricard. Uh, so he was really known for his packaging and doing calendars and posters that really kind of got the spices a buzz. And they're still here today after being created in 1880. They, this is actually the original packaging from 1880. Now it comes in a big box with a, kind of a portly chef. And this is the only place that you can find this is at the store that I was telling you about at the beginning that got me to move to Marseille. That's called Maison Empereur. It's uh, France's oldest hardware store. And it also is a treasure trove with over 60,000 items. Now the apices are made by the Laboratoire Herboristerie Générale. It's a local spice company. So we're gonna take a visit to Ms. meet Gilles, who is uh, the owner. He's gonna tell us about the packaging. We're gonna see the machine that makes the spices. But first we're gonna stop in the Maison Emploi so you can have a look. In the heart of Marseille, you'll find France's oldest hardware store, and so much more. Open since 1827, Maison Emploi stocks over 60,000 items, earning its nickname as Alibaba's Cavern. This marvelous shop spreads out over three buildings, each section is tucked away in its own nook, so the discovery of each one feels like a treasure hunt. Among them, find knives, cookware, cleaning supplies, home goods, toys, Marseille's famous olive oil soap, and hundreds of brackets, hooks, and screws to make a handyman swoon. The staff in iconic French blue work jackets are happy to help guide you or let yourself get lost amongst the shelves. Helmed by the same family for six generations, Maison Empereur celebrates heritage brands from France and Europe. It is here I first discovered Epice Fabelais on a shelf behind the cashier in the cooking section. Turns out this is the only shop that sells the spices in their original packaging thanks to a friendship between Maison Empereur's owner, Laurence, and the head of Epice Fabelais, Gilles. I'll let him tell you about the packaging and his famous spice blend. So, I'm Gilles Talric, and I'm the president of the Laboratoire d'Arboristerie Générale.
et le laboratoire d'herboristerie générale euh, est propriétaire de la formule secrète des épices rabelais. Et les épices euh, rabelais ont été créées, le mélange a été créé en 1880 à Marseille. Et c'est l'idée de, de, de Renaud de Mazan, donc, qui était le, le fondateur de des, le créateur des épices Rabelais, qui a eu l'idée d'associer les épices qui venaient d'Orient, puisque Marseille, c'était le port des épices, avec les, les aromates, donc le, le thym, le romarin, euh, qui poussaient dans les collines de Provence. Donc, euh, je, je vous lis l'étiquette, hein, le taux de l'étiquette de l'époque. Euh, ce qui est écrit là-dessus, on n'a plus le droit de le dire. L'épice rablée composée, c'était le nom du produit, stimule l'appétit, relève le goût des aliments et facilite la digestion. Aujourd'hui, c'est considéré, décrire ça, ça serait considéré comme un médicament. Ça veut dire que si je n'ai pas 15 études de laboratoire qui mmh. le prouvent, je ne peux pas l'écrire. Okay. À l'époque, on pouvait l'écrire. Après, il parle de la composition. Elle est composée des substances végétales aromatiques d'origine exotique et indigène. Les proportions de chaque sorte sont, par une longue expérience, savamment combinées dans leur mélange, ce qui en fait un condiment d'une indéfinissable saveur. Cette épice est l'âme, l'esprit caché d'une bonne cuisine où les fins gourmets peuvent se délecter. Nota. Elle est employée avec grand succès pour la fabrication de la fine charcuterie, pâté et conserve. J'adore cette étiquette. I love that the the poetry behind this packaging. It's really it's really beautiful. So I'm glad that Gilles could translate that for all of you. Um, if you're wondering what to do with your spices, so as he said, uh, the pieces are really used by many charcutiers and butchers in France. So it really marries well with any roast, stews, charcuterie, any, any cooked meat. Um, it's also for you vegetarians. It's great with squash or winter vegetables. It really likes heat. So roasting is a great idea. Um, also for dessert, it's excellent in pies, tarts, think almonds, walnuts, also fruit. I really love to put it, I sprinkle it on poached pears or roasted figs and it's, it really makes your house smell lovely. If you, if you do happen to speak French, so they published a, a cookbook, but they also have a website and they have a zillion recipes on it. And Gilles has promised me it will be eventually translated into other languages. So that's also a nice idea if you'd like to do that. Uh, next, we, we, we can't talk about Marseille without talking about the city's most famous and most used condiment. Marseille is nicknamed the Sahara of the Sea because it has an enormous um, uh, North African population. Starting in about the late 19th century, Tunisians, Moroccans, and Algerians came here because that was really the boom of Marseille, our belle époque, when we were building like crazy. Then after World War I, a lot of French lives were lost. And so France really counted on the Maghrebi to come and help replace the, that manpower that had been lost in the war. But really the biggest wave of migration happened after the countries gained their independence and the French colonial period ended. And France gave a lot of the Maghrebis citizenship And that's when the city got really uh, became almost, we're now more than a third North African. You'll find couscous everywhere. Couscous actually is the now most consumed dish of France to show how these immigration waves have really spread throughout the country. And with the couscous, everybody loves harissa. This harissa comes from the tip of Tunisia in a place called the Cap Bon, the Faro du Cap Bon, and it's been made since 1942. It's a lot of you maybe have heard of harissa. It's a piquant red pepper paste, and it's good with really just about <laughs> everything. People here like it with couscous, tagines, on eggs, sandwiches, 
If you go to a, a, stand, a snack stand to get fries, they love it on fries. This particular harissa has a pretty strong kick. So a little goes a long way, be careful. We buy it at one of our favorite stores that we visit on our tour, which is called Saladin, Epice du Monde, the spices of the world. And it's in the neighborhood of Noai, which is really the multicultural heart of Marseille. So let's take a visit to Noai and Saladin and taste some harissa. Here we are in Noai. This neighborhood is known as the belly of Marseille, both for its central location and its abundance of food stands, markets, street food, and specialty shops. From Armenians to Senegalese, immigrants across Marseille come here to stock up on foodstuffs from their homeland. You can find Tunisian donuts, Algerian barley couscous, rotisserie chickens, pizza by the slice, a fresh fermented milk stand, and bunches of cilantro and mint like on a Moroccan street. One of their go-to addresses is Salad and Spice Emporium, where we buy our harissa. Bonjour. Bonjour. Est-ce que je peux prendre la harissa, s'il vous plaît? Oui, la harissa. Oui. Ah, la harissa. Voilà. Et qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec la harissa? Alors, la harissa, c'est du piment, du oh. piment fort. Alors ça, on peut cuisiner avec ça pour euh, épicer les plats, ou bien pour manger même euh, direct comme ça, avec des frites, ou bien avec les pâtes aussi. Et c'est du piment, c'est fort ça, ça pique beaucoup. Ok, donc faites attention. Donc il n'aime pas les, les piments, ça marche pas avec ça. Ok, ça, va. Ça va pas avec ça. Et après, que le, les gens qui aiment les plats épices et tout ça, ça c'est le meilleur piment du Tunisie, ça vient du Tunisie. Ah, c'est le meilleur. Ouais, c'est le meilleur. Meilleur marque, c'est là. Voilà. So at the end of the video, I included a few pictures of dishes that people will eat harissa with. Um, they're, most, they're Tunisian dishes from my favorite Tunisian place, Shea Yassin, which we also visit on our tour. The soup is a chickpea soup called Leb Lebi, which is with tons of garlic. So it's the best flu buster around. They're also the dish that kind of resembled chakshuka is called Woyja, and it's a similar dish with eggs, tomato, peppers, and merguez. And then uh, there was a Tunisian salad with tuna fish and fresh veggies, and then of course, a couscous. So now let's move on to the sweet side of things. Uh, Marseille and Provence have a common tradition where we eat, we like our dry biscuits that are made with olive oil, flour, and sugar. Simple. Sometimes they'll put a little nuts, sometimes a little fleur d'orange, orange flower water, but really um, they're, they're simple, they're inexpensive, they last for a long time, and they're really popular here. And they're different to up north in France when things are made with eggs and butter and cream, and it's richer, and it also requires refrigeration. One of the, I would say my favorite cookie is called a canestrelli. If you can see, those are little anise seeds in it. The canestrelli comes from Corsica, most Marseille think, but actually it originated in Genoa. But Genoa, before Corsica became a protectorate of France, it was actually between the 13th and 18th century part of Italy. So that's why a lot of the Corsicans you meet have names that sound like they're Italian names. The Canestrelli came to Marseille because the city has a massive Corsican community. A lot of Corsicans will come here to work and go to school because there isn't a lot of things for them to do on the island. We apparently have more Corsicans than the capital, Ajaccio, and though it's hard to do statistics in France because it's illegal to ask people's origin, rumor has it that Marseille has over 200,000 Corsicans, which is about a quarter of the city's population. 
One of my favorite Corsicans is Jose Orsoni, and he runs a biscuiterie, which is called the Navette des Ecoules. It's in Le Panier neighborhood. And let's go visit him and see how he makes these canestrelli. With its winding streets and charming facades, Le Panier resembles a Provencal village, but its colorful street art reminds you that you're in Marseille. The neighborhood has been home to the city's many waves of immigrants, making it a fitting locale for a biscuiterie with Corsican roots. The Navette des Ecoules sells traditional crunchy biscuits that are common across Provence, Navette, almond croquants, and our favorite canestrelles pictured here. Owner José Orsoni has been baking since 1986. You can taste his passion for Marseille and Corsica with each bite. Named the maitre artisan, a master artisan, José's savoir-faire plays an important role in preserving Marseille's culinary culture. Here he is making orange canestrelli, which are decadently dusted with sugar. This is Marie-Julie, José's daughter. After traveling the world, she has returned to her roots. Growing up in a bakery, she was destined to be part of the family business. Est-ce que vous pouvez présenter? Comment vous appelez-vous? José Orsoni. Alors, c'est pas suédois, c'est corse. Je viens de Corse, je suis, je suis né à Marseille, parce qu'à l'époque, mes parents, à l'époque, disons, des époques où on est pour trouver du travail, on était obligé de venir à Marseille. Okay. Mon père était navigateur, donc il fallait qu'il vienne de Marseille. Alors ça, c'est une recette de ma grand-mère maternelle, oui. qui était la pâtissière de mon village. Ok. Et qui, qui fait... Alors c'est un biscuit où il n'y a pas de beurre, pas d'œuf. C'est vegan. Ah ouais Et oui, il y en a. Donc il n'y a pas le beurre et ni le œuf. Donc c'est quoi dedans Dedans, il y a de l'huile d'olive oui. et du vin blanc. Je précise, c'est pas un vin blanc, bon, c'est pas un château Margot, mais c'est pas du vin de table. Que je, je mets un vin de pique, qui est déjà un peu plus. Okay. Ça, c'est ce qu'on fait dans le, dans le nord, en balade, c'est ce qu'on fait en, dans le nord de la Corse. Ok. Voilà. Et le anis, euh, les graines d'anis C'est des graines d'anis vert. Ok. Il n'y a, a, a pas de. Il y en a qui mettent de la métole dedans. Oui. Là, c'est garanti que des graines d'anis. D'ailleurs, il y en a beaucoup, parce qu'il faut qu'il qu y ait le. Ça, c'est la formée précédente. Ah, ok. Qu'on mélange avec. Ah Donc, c'est le pâte précédent. Et pourquoi ouais. vous faites ça Parce qu'il y, y a toujours un, un, petit, un petit goût qui reste. Euh, même avec de la levure, euh, qui n'est pas de la levure de boulanger. Ok. Qui est du backing. Oui. Ça garde un petit. Euh, ça rajoute un petit quelque chose. Mmh. I love how he puts the, the dough from the previous batch into the new dough so that it's his little special secret that he says adds something. It makes me want to do that when I bake cookies at my house. <laughs> so the reason that I pick the aniseed for the canestrelli because they come in different flavors is because anise is a really strong flavor here. Um, it's obviously what's in pastis. Also, we have breads like fougassier and gibassier that are really tasty. And our bouillabasse is made with fennel, which is a vegetable that's used in a lot of cooking. It's also rumored to help with digestion. So I'd like to think that these cookies are good for you. The Marseillais will usually eat canestrelli either in the morning with our cafe or as an afternoon snack. And because they last for months, often people will have jars of canestrelli in their house so that they always have something sweet to have around. So last but not least, let's talk about chocolate. Uh, the, the French, we love chocolate. Where it's the sixth, I think the country with the sixth highest consumption of chocolate in the world. 
Marseille as a port up until about the mid 20th century, it would welcome most of the cocoa beans that came from Africa and from South America. And then it would distribute them throughout Europe to chocolatiers who would turn them into chocolate. In Marseille in 1971, we had a chocolatier who created the Bar Marseillaise. And this is a truffle bar that miraculously is made without butter or cream, which is really kind of true to the Southern tradition of keeping things simple. Our favorite one comes from a small chocolatier that's called the Chocolatier de Marseille. It is a true Marseille story, a multicultural love tale where uh, Zerin, who is Turkish, came to Marseille and she met her husband, Alan, who's of Armenian descent. She didn't speak any French, and so she got a job in a chocolate shop. She, was, she loved what she did, and she also was really touched by the fact by how happy chocolate made people. And so she decided to open up her own atelier with her husband. At their little shop, which we visit on the tour, they make the chocolate upstairs fresh every day. And so it always smells really, really good when you walk in. So let's take a visit, hear about their story and learn about how they make the Bar Marseillaise and most importantly, how to eat it. Qu'est-ce que c'est le bar marseillaise ah, La bar marseillaise, c'est un lingot d'or. C'est un lingot noir. C'est du chocolat. Euh, mais à l'intérieur, il n'y a pas de crème et il n'y a pas de beurre. Donc c'est quoi en l'intérieur Ah, surprise <rire> C'est un praliné à base de noisettes. On fait travailler euh, le, 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 le gras de la noisette et avec du chocolat. Ok, et c'est quoi les différences avec votre bar marseillaise par rapport à les autres Nous ici, on n'utilise pas de produits, euh, des colorants, euh, des, euh, des essences, euh, on n'utilise pas tout le monde. C'est uniquement naturel, euh, okay. c'est uniquement naturel. Un praliné à base de pistache, c'est de la pistache. Euh, avec du sucre euh, qui est caramélisé et qui est ensuite broyé euh, et on rajoute du chocolat, euh, tout simplement. Oui. Une chose comme il euh, n'y a pas de beurre, il n'y a pas de crème fraîche dans nos bars, il ne faut pas mettre au frigo. Température euh, ambiante. Ça ne okay. pas. Voilà. C'est jusqu'à 22-23 degrés, il n'y a pas de problème pour garder à la maison dans une pièce un peu plus fraîche possible. Voilà. Ok. Et Zerine, vous m'avez dit la différence des gens qui mangent en fait le chocolat noir et le chocolat lait. Mm -hmm. euh, le pourcentage des gens, ils, ils préfèrent quoi en fait La plupart des gens, ils préfèrent le chocolat noir. Ok. Euh, même en généralité, Tandis que les bars ou les nombreux ceux qui ont fait, ils préfèrent le chocolat noir. Les vrais connaisseurs. Mais après, bien sûr, pour les plus dans les ventes, ça correspond à, Dans les ventes, ça correspond à 70% chocolat noir okay. et 30% chocolat, chocolat au lait. Et est-ce que vous pouvez me montrer comment manger un bar marseillaise Bien sûr, je, je vous montre. Parfait. Si vous voulez, vous pouvez même déguster. Mmh. Ok. Ça, vous faites des... Mais il parle comme ça. Et le feuilletage qui fait. 
le son. Parfait. Et pourquoi on mange comme ça? Euh, pour faire durer le plaisir. <rire> Et si vous êtes gourmand, vous pouvez croquer aussi. Mais notre concept, c'est de partager. Voilà. Manger en famille, dans une... après, après manger, on partage avec un petit bout de chocolat et on fait durer le plaisir jusqu'à la fin de bas. Vous êtes bienvenue à Marseille. Ici, à Marseille, il fait très beau. C'est une très belle ville. Et euh, nous espérons vous revoir bientôt ici. Euh, avec patience. Avec une patience. <rire>was minimized, so we'll try and get those videos to send out to you in the follow-up email tomorrow so you can see the whole thing and also have the subtitles. Um, so a couple questions right away. Uh, there's a question about some anti-immigrant sentiment that's been happening in Marseille and how do you, Alexis, and like how do other people, you know, the food producers you were talking to um, kind of navigate that and deal with it since obviously it's such a immigrant city. Yeah, you know, Marseille is an interesting city. They say um, there's something called Mediterranean racism where people of different cultures can cohabitate and live shoulder to shoulder and shop in the same store and be together, but they don't necessarily actually mix. And so I would say Marseille kind of fits into that. So even though we have this very multicultural city, one of the things that surprised me living here is that there are, it isn't like everybody gets along per se. Um, I think it's more that people live politely together. Marseille has miraculously, um, France has had a lot of uh, anti-immigration and anti-Semitism, and we've had you know, a lot of attacks recently. And Marseille has managed, they say part of the reason why it's managed to remain a bit unscathed is because of this coexistence. It's not perfect. It's not like everyone's breaking bread together, but there's a certain respect, even if they don't necessarily like each other. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, someone asked, you know, what are the what are the best neighborhoods to visit in Marseille if you're really looking for an authentic food experience? Uh, wow, well, yeah, everywhere. No. <laughs> um, I mean, so you you definitely... start, if you go, you have to just take the culinary back streets. Exactly, and then you'll learn. <laughs> yeah, so you definitely have to, I mean, I would definitely say Noai, uh, you would start with. And then next to Noai, there's a neighborhood called Cor Julien, which is uh, kind of a uh, sort of hipster graffiti. There's lots of little tiny restaurants and really multicultural restaurants. I also like a neighborhood called Cinq Avenue that's um, next to Cor Julien. And that is also nice because it really, it's very mom and pop shops. And there there's farmer's markets, there's the fromagerie, the boulangerie, the boucherie. Um, that's really great as well. And even the Vieux Port, which is the center of Marseille, also is, it's something that's used by the locals as well as the tourists. Thank you. Um, is there a best time of year to go? Is there a certain time you should avoid? And are there any special festivities or city holidays to know? So I would say, yeah, it, I would say actually, weirdly, the time of year to not come, I would say August. I think in France, it's a complicated month because the entire country has vacation. And so you'll end up coming to a city that doesn't actually have a lot of Marseille. So you'll, you'll get your probably least authentic experience, even though it's a very popular time to travel. I think the best time to come to the city is the spring, uh, like between March and June or the fall, because you'll still be able to 
go to the beach, which is pretty important, take a boat ride, and then also have, you know, the spring is really beautiful in Provence because it's really, we have all the produce, we have the local cheese, all these things come out. And so, but even, I mean, even winter, we have a lovely Christmas market because Marseille has um, these little figurines that are made. So it's very charming in the winter too. So I would say the only issue is that sometimes in January, restaurants might be closed if you're really coming to eat. <laughs> That's for that. And then as far as holidays go, the city doesn't necessarily have anything particular uh, per se. We do have uh, a nice Fête de la Musique um, in June 21st, but it's nice to come if you come between December or like November and March is the seafood season. So we have what's called orsinades, which are basically giant parties where people buy platters of sea urchins, oysters, etc. and eat those. And then in the fall, we have sardinades, which are, again, the same thing with sardines. So that's pretty fun to experience. Sorry, just repeat that. What through March? Is oh, yeah. November through March. Yeah. For the for the seafood, kind of the seafood season. Good to know. Yeah. OK, um, hopefully that'll work out next year. <laughs> <laughs> Another question is, you know, while we're on the topic, like what's going on? With the pandemic, are, are you all getting your vaccines? Like bring us up to speed with how everything is happening right now. Yeah, for, Marseille is sort of like a, in a little bubble. I mean, things don't feel like there's a pandemic in spite of the fact, I mean, France has a national curfew at 6 p.m. You're technically supposed to be at home, but the city, there are people out drinking and having apro. Restaurants are technically closed, and sadly, we haven't had the same as in the States where we don't have outdoor dining, we have nothing, but we do have to go. And because it's so nice, the weather here, a lot of the restaurants have stayed open and they're serving food so that people can go out. The, as far as France goes and the vaccines, we're really, we're at 5%. There's a lot of anti-vaccine sentiment. So we'll see what happens. Um, as far as the rest of Europe, we're doing okay. But for instance, Paris is being threatened to shut down this weekend. There's a lot of talk that we'll see what happens after Easter because Easter is a huge holiday in France. There's a lot of worry that people are going to get together we'll have a spike and then we'll see what happens. But if we manage to keep it under control, they're hoping to reopen things mid-April, end of April. Okay. Um, someone asked about the logo that's on the Marseille Culinary Backstreets tote bag. What's the story with that? Oh yeah, the logo. Yeah, so that is um, a langoustine. So that is, we wanted to have in the color of the bag is rosé for, and then also like the langoustine because we felt it was really important to have seafood for as part of our city because we it is so ingrained in our food history here. And what are some local cheeses to Marseille? I would say, so the most popular, the most known is uh, something called Bruce de Rove. Uh, Bruce is a cheese that people often mistake for ricotta. It's very similar and it's made from this really beautiful, if you look up Bruce, B-R-O-U-S-S-E, uh, Rove, R-O-V-E, these goats are like the prettiest goats I've ever seen. And they are made all around the city. Um, I'm actually working on an article about Bruce de Rove. So if you look at Culinary Backstreets in a week, you'll be able to see it. But, um, that's like a fresh cheese and so people really like to eat it either on bread with drizzled with olive oil and salt and pepper or they'll also eat it for dessert with drizzled with honey because we're in the south we don't have a lot of cheeses per se like other parts of France but this Bruce is really our our kind of our go-to great um, how is the development of the ports and investment in shipping shaped Marseille Wow, that's a good question. So the city, since its inception, it, it I would say it was very much built by the port. Why the city is what it is today is because it was, at one point, it was the most prominent port in France and in Europe. And so it really, and also it was going places, it was going as far as China, it was going to South America. What's happened in the past 30 or so years is that the port used to be centralized at the Vieux Port, which is our center of the city, and it's been moved outside of the sort of to the edge of the city. And so what that means is that the city has been diversified by other, by other industries. We do, though, have the third largest shipping company in the world, CMA, CGM. And I know that when I go back to Seattle and I see their containers and I see these containers all over the world, that's where I realize how prominent Marseille still is in terms of shipping. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. 
Is there a typical breakfast that's eaten in Marseille? Uh, yeah, the French and breakfast are funny in Marseille. <laughs> they don't eat breakfast it's really pretty much coffee and then your canestrelli your navette uh we do have croissants here but people seem to more they really love the dry biscuit that's that's their their most prominent thing or people forego breakfast and just have a few coffees and a cigarette exactly that is still tried and true that's still the thing. okay yeah um, i'm glad to know those they haven't got they haven't gotten the message <laughs> All right, what about sea urchin? How do locals enjoy sea urchin and other seafood? Yeah, so sea urchin, they enjoy it plucked out of the sea and eaten with a spoon is usually the most popular way. Um, you will also see it on pasta, like in Italy, people like it that way. One of the thing that I that I didn't mention that's made in Marseille is something called is putarg, which is botarga in Italy. So it's red bullet eggs that are dried and then wrapped in wax. And you cut it really, really thin and you eat that with like a splash of lemon or olive oil or shaved on pasta. And that's like a very, very traditional Marseille dish because it's preserved so it lasts forever you can bring it with you on a picnic on a hike and so it's like portable seafood perfect um how about local wines what are your favorites uh well we're in the land of rosé <laughs> it is I think 80% of rosé production happens in Provence. Uh, my favorite wines in the region are Bendel, which is um, just outside of the city. I also really like their reds, which are, uh, they are Mourvedre. And speaking of the Mistral, the Mourvedre vines are really low and bushy. And they say they developed that way to kind of withstand the crazy wind. But what the wind does is it naturally cleans the grapes. If it rains, it takes the humidity away. So it removes fungus. And so I think it just creates these really, really delicious wines. Um, and for whites, we like uh, Vermontino, which is called a Rolle in French and really kind of across Provence. Yeah, so speaking of the Mistral, one of the questions was, is, is it, which was such a big part of our, our <laughs> best appearance by the Mistral, is it seasonal or are there certain times of year? No, that's what's funny about it. It happens all year round. Um, they say that it happens in one, three or six days. Um, and in the right now it's spring. So we're having, it's as warm as 70 degrees. When the mistral blows, it feels like it's below zero. And then in the summer when it blows, it is really sandy and sweaty and dirty. And it's, but the beauty of the mistral is that it, they say it's sort of the reason why that Marseille has such beautiful light because it cleans the sky. And so the day after the Mistral, it is the most unbelievable blue that you've ever seen. And so we grin and we bear it. <laughs> and thank you all for grinning and bearing it this evening, especially at the beginning of the program. Really super appreciate that. Um, so doggy bags were typically taboo in French restaurants. Has the pandemic changed that attitude? Wow, that's a good question. You know, when Macron got elected, he made a law that doggy bags had to be allowed because he felt like that the French were insulting tourists and their food habits. Um, I definitely think that noticing in the past year, you rarely would see people eating, you know, from a bat, eating a sandwich while walking, things that Americans really do. And they're now people are eating at their office in front of their desks and their computers. So I hope that it's not ruining things, but definitely I think takeout has taken on a whole new acceptance level here for sure. Yeah, makes sense. That's a great question. <laughs> Someone asked if the if Bandol is a good match for the chocolate. Oh, definitely the Morvedra without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's not, um, uh, Morvedra is not very fruity. And so I think it, it, it has a nice, uh, it's an earthiness that I think goes well with the, the bitterness of the chocolate, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so last question, it's not, it's not really a question, just something that um, a couple of people asked, I think in the, in the postcard or, or some kind of packing list that came with the box, it mentioned a book and a tote bag, um, which wasn't part of the box, but that was not actually supposed to be part of the box, right? No, what happened was um, the bag, hopefully they all got a tote bag, but the book, what happened was for some reason, the, the custom forms, even though on my computer, it read one thing when it printed, I guess it said that there was a book. And so that was the, that was the mistake that happened because the custom forms, we've been shipping boxes from all of our cities 
And so there was a book with the Barcelona, the project, the plan is to publish a Marseille book, but we're still creating content for that. Okay, got it. So there's no book. So sorry for the confusion. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like maybe some of you didn't get your tote bag. So is it okay to just let you know if people didn't Yeah, get for sure. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. That out. Um, and then also this... This is being recorded. I'm recording right now. So everyone will get the recording tomorrow. So not to worry. Um, you can watch it anytime. And I think that's it for questions for Alexis. So thank you so much. Please send my vaccine passport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you just made us, you know, so excited to travel when we can do so. I personally cannot wait to come to Marseille and take the Culinary Backstreets tour. Um, we do have another Culinary Backstreets program already on the calendar for MOFAD. It's in May. It's Cinco de Mayo and guess what? It's Mexico City, so perfect. Um, I'm gonna send everyone an email tomorrow with like the link to watch the recording, um, to all of the information and resources that Alexa shared. And, um, oh, and if you didn't get the box, I'll make sure to send you the link so you can order the box directly from Culinary Backstreet so you can have your own experience at home. All right, everyone, um, someone's screen sharing, so it feels like this is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so much, Alexis. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thanks see you so much, everyone. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.